very good morning to everyone. It is Monday the 5th of August. Hope you all had a fantastic weekend. Um, looking at the calendar here for the main kind of scheduled events from a fundamental perspective, what we've got to look out for. So I'm going to run you through that. Uh, but before we go into that, obviously there is one big story to talk about this morning that broke last night, and that is the latest coming out of Beijing um, asking state-owned companies to suspend imports of U.S. agricultural goods. They've also allowed the yuan to weaken past uh, seven. The renminbi falling past seven per dollar for the first time in 11 years, and that's created then one of the biggest down days of the year so far in Asian. Pacific equity markets, and therefore the futures markets here have been under pressure um, just following suit. So DAX, having moved lower overnight, has found some support around its respective S2, but down about 128. The Nasdaq's already down off 100, uh, and the S&P down towards the 2900 handle at the moment. So obviously I'll, I'll let Sam go over the, the technicals in more detail, but a, a real clear reflection of risk off trade this morning. So with equity index futures lower, uh, T-notes and gold already quite sharply higher. I can't think of, of many times actually when I've come in in the morning and I've seen T-notes up nearly a point on the session. They're up about 25 and a half at the minute. Very rare, but just given the gravity of the, the latest development here and the kind of escalation, if you like, on the Chinese side, it's almost like they've hit their stop now with Donald Trump and, and now it's really got serious. And, Gold obviously elevated on the back of this, renewed risk. Uh, gold futures top right, just finding a bit of resistance thus far at the R2, but up about $11.5 trading at 14.69 at the moment. So yeah, interesting times. So let's get straight into the headlines. What exactly has been happening? And you know, here it is, China hitting back at Trump. You'll remember last week, Donald Trump tweeted the idea about proposed additional 10% tariffs on another 300 billion of Chinese goods uh, imports from September 1st. This was after almost like a 24-hour turnaround of those US officials leaving Shanghai. It caught a lot of people by surprise last week about how quickly the president acted in such an aggressive way and apparently against what he was being uh, advised to do from the likes of Steven Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary. And this is what's caused this now uh, reaction from from China. So a few charts to have a look at to really put this into context and uh, this is looking at the, the Chinese renminbi falling past a key seven a dollar threshold. You can see here we flirted with this level uh, a couple of times. We got very close to it not that long ago. Uh, I'm trying to think when it was now, probably about a year ago or so and, and certainly when we had that uh, fears of a hard landing going through 2015-16 with China. That was also a level. And you can see that, that, that you know, there's quite a clear understanding, or there has been in the markets, that, that China uh, want to protect that seven level. It's quite symbolic in a way. And certainly given the fact that we've not really, um, the Chinese currency hasn't been that weak, you've got to go all the way back to the right in the midst of the global financial crisis at the time. Now, reasoning for protecting it is predominantly down to this idea that once you kind of pull the plug on seven, you know, does seven quickly become seven and a half and eight? And therefore, then the weakening of the local currency has ramifications for any assets held in that or dominate, denominated in that currency. And therefore, people quickly pull their capital. And this leads to large scale capital outflows, which further exacerbates that situation quite quickly to the detriment of the country. Um, one of the things then to be aware of is that, uh, and I know most of you are familiar with this, but for those who are not, um, I mean, this is one of the biggest gripes, of course, by Donald Trump, is because China operates what an FX kind of trading band, which is basically 2% either side of a daily fix rate that they have. Uh, so obviously in Trump's mind, this is kind of manipulation in its purest. Uh, but as you can see here, you've got basically where the, uh, the onshore exchange rate tends to trade in comparison to the band. And as you had imagined, the price sits pretty much neatly in the middle. All the way through, you can see Q4 of last year, the first half of this year, we had that little episode. Remember we had the 
bit of downside in the market, concerns renewed about you know, Trump then escalating the next section of tariffs here. But you know, dramatic moves seen overnight, and that's pressured it right to the bottom of that trading ban floor, as you can see. See and, and notably going through that that seven level. Now, one of the things that um, China have said is they've attributed basically the yuan move to protectionism and expectations on additional tariffs on Chinese goods. So, helping to weaken their currency a little bit. And what they're saying is that they can maintain a steady currency, i.e., looking to verbally um, calm those fears about mass capital outflows. Now. A mid-2015 devaluation spurred capital outflows and did destabilize global markets to, to quite a significant degree, though tighter capital controls are believed to be this time round what makes quite a substantial difference and that in order to help prevent a similar rerun of what we had about four and a half years ago, essentially, as far as what a lot of the analysts are saying this morning. So point being is that China are suggesting can manage this process of having a weaker currency. This obviously then starts to go against what Donald Trump has been doing because it shows that they're further looking to you know, a lot of people talking about the weaponizing of the currency this morning. Um, but the other major and significant headline that came this morning was this one. Uh, Beijing asked its state-owned firms to suspend U.S. crop purchases. You know, so this again, we know this is the more uh, surgical way of China really hitting um, Trump where it hurts, which is right at the core of his political base, uh, and obviously incredibly important as we go into the run into the 2020 um, campaign, which is now underway. Um, how have this? How have the, the Americans tried to counteract this? Well, I was looking at some interesting charts at the weekend. Vietnam and South Korea have seen massive jumps um, in, in exports uh, directly coming from U.S. imports uh, as they try to look the Americans for some alternative way to try and buy a still, still some, a lot of these products that are produced uh, in that region. But for China, you know, this really is. Uh, a substantial increase in the way of which they have been relatively passive up to this point. Uh, this certainly brings about one very interesting question. And the main thing I'm looking out for today is when Donald Trump wakes up, what does he say? That's probably in today's intraday session going to be the singular most market moving event of today. Uh, and going off the data, obviously there was those tragic you know, mass shootings in America. So he is operating from North American hours. So I'd say you need to start watching your Twitter feed from 11.40 is what the data tells me. 11.42 to be precise is when uh, Trump tends to start tweeting uh, and stuff that's more sensitive to financial markets. And particularly, I have no doubt in my mind, Trump first tweet is going to be about this uh, latest development. Now, my opinion is I don't think he's going to buckle. I think if you're looking for Trump to come out later and say, hang about, I love China and China, we're going to cut them a great deal. And you think he's going to manage the fallout. I think actually, I think he wants a little bit of a, of a stock market route. We've got up to record highs. I think if you bump the stock market down a little bit more, akin to the correction we had at the beginning of 2018, at the end of 2018, you know, let's really start heaping the pressure on Powell because that ultimately is the stronger force here. If he can really create this multiple sequence of rate cuts from the Fed, I, I think then he gets what he wants. So I don't think Trump's going to buckle, not particularly given the events as well that have happened at the weekend. I think politically he needs to show he's in control. I don't think he's going to... I don't think he's going to flip it that quick. So if that is the case, potentially, as we go into the North American crossover, could there be a renewed second phase to this move? Certainly, that could be the case. But quite to the contrary, if I'm wrong, then I'd be looking for a reversal of a lot of these moves, equity recovery, gold pulling back, as well as the 10-year uh, in that respect. A couple of uh, bank comments. What have they said? Well, you have had JP Morgan. They've come out this morning. They now see China letting the yuan sink through seven per dollar. Their new call is at 7.05. Uh, 
Uh, analysts at Goldman Sachs have also issued a new yen forecast uh, of 103 per dollar in the three months. Uh, that's from their previous forecast of 107. Dollar yen this morning in the futures uh, is trading at 105.65. So again, if you look at dollar yen over the course of the last well, really going from the 1st of August to where we are at the moment, we've moved from 109 to 105. That's a substantial move, but as I say, next three-month outlook, Goldman's looking for 103. What does that mean for um, rate expectations? Well, I did have a quick look this morning at the, the CME Fed Watch, looking at the federal funds rate futures in the short end. And actually now, instead of pricing in 100% for a 25 cut in September, the 50s come back again. It's like, a, it's like a broken record. Here we are again. Markets are now pricing in similar setup to really on the percentage split of what we had from the last meeting. We're now looking at a 16.5% and growing probability here of a 50 basis point cut to 1.5% to 1.75%. So yeah, definitely worth keeping an eye on. Quickly elsewhere, some other news stories to be aware of from the weekend. Um, just generally speaking, people are talking about oil, and I guess oil at the moment is a trade-off between supply shocks from the Strait of Hormuz. This comes after um, essentially another Iranian tanker seizure. Um, however, this is being overshadowed by the magnitude of the development that's happened overnight. So if anything, WCI crude at the moment um, is down 60 cents. I think, if anything, people are becoming rather accustomed to the situation um, with Iran. I actually read quite an interesting article in the New York Times at the weekend, which had a really neat infographic. And it was basically saying that everyone's still buying Iranian crude and they're still pumping it because they're just basically t <laughs> that they're just turning off the surveillance equipment and the ships just go and deliver where they need to go and deliver from Iran's perspective. Um, and obviously, who's buying that? Well, the Chinese. The Indians, the usual kind of suspects in that in that respect, who are not so keen to adhere to the U.S. sanctions or what the U.S. are requesting. Um, so yeah, at the moment the broader trade rhetoric overshadowing any of the supply situation. And then over in the U.K., I'm sure you've you've heard plenty of Boris um, ramping up his cash pledge for the NHS. You know, multiple billion pounds worth of boost. Uh, that with infrastructure, with putting more police on the street, you know, everyone's kind of reading between the lines. This is pretty much uh, as clear as you're going to get of him lining up then this general election. Uh, the only uh, uncertainty here is the timing of when exactly is that going to happen. The only deadline we know definitively is that it's still October 31st for the time being for the elapse of Article 50 and the threat of a uh, no deal uh, situation. So yeah, that's what I'm going to say on that point. Going back to then the week in focus. Uh, so Monday is actually taking on a new realm of significance. Certainly the biggest thing here is going to be the response from Donald Trump. Again, can't stress how important that's going to be today. Secondly, um, just quickly talking overview for the UK. Obviously the British pound is still at a fairly precarious technical level. Very close to multi-decade lows again, close to that post media EU referendum low. Um, two things really, um, or three things we're looking out for. Uh, you've got UK service PMI coming out later on this morning, half past nine, and obviously the service sector, particularly important for the composition of, of economic growth in this country. Um, that is expected to be kind of stagnating more than anything. So rather than the contraction very evident in manufacturing and construction, service is still just keeping its, he its head above water. But then on Friday, we get UK GDP. Uh, and obviously, from a, a more rolling basis, we're looking for basically flat growth in the UK. Um, and I was thinking about this at the weekend and, and just the way that Boris has been going about his political business. I actually think if you get a weak service PMI and a weak GDP, I actually think that plays in Boris's hands uh, in a rather weird way. And it's kind of a bit of a Trumpism where I think the worse the economy is at the moment, the more he can pass accountability to the previous government under Theresa May and the more reason there is to hold this general election. So I think that, I don't really think that that's a bad thing for him if the economy is buckling under the pressure of the growing uh, likelihood of a no deal. I actually think that's uh, a positive for his, his 
messaging from the communication point of view. So there are two key points. The political one, obviously, looking out for other updates surrounding Boris is the, is the third point. Um, otherwise, other things to be aware of, a um, couple of central bank decisions. Um, you've, got, you've got plenty, actually. Um, you've got the RBA and the RBNZ and the RBI all coming out this week. Uh, for the RBA, uh, after they've cut rates a couple of times now, we're actually looking for them to hold PAT for the moment. So that'll be coming out tonight going into Tuesday morning. Uh, you've then got the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. Um, they're looking to cut this time round. I think markets are pricing in another cut by about November of this year. So definitely interesting if you're trading those Antipodean currencies. Obviously for the Aussie in particular, um, monitoring of this trade war is going to be particularly key from a fundamental perspective. Um, and then from China themselves, you do actually get Chinese trade balance data on Thursday. And so again, I'm um, particularly interested to see the, what is more likely or not the decrease in the rate of exports and imports out of the country and it's more about an assessment of the severity of that slowdown that's key and also the inflationary aspects, uh, PPI we've seen decreasing, we've seen a basically a divergence between Chinese PPI falling and CPI rising given the swine flu at the moment uh, impacting particularly uh, pig farming and consequently pork and food inflation has been quite high in China. So it'd be interested to see how that's also faring at the moment, obviously putting a bit of a squeeze on the consumer, but very evident about the manufacturing export slowdown from the decrease in PPI. Uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's pretty much it in a summary. Um, German factory orders and German industrial production is also something I'm going to be watching uh, particularly closely just given the fact of the current situation that Germany is facing economically, which has been a contraction in those type of areas as well, and how critical they are for now understanding about the next move of the ECB. All right, if you want this uh, update, though, the full graphic is available on my, uh, my Twitter feed. You can see my handle just pointing to it down here. So if you do need that, um, just feel free to jump on there and, and check that out. All right, going to hand you over to Sam. He can look at the charts and give you his technical feel for the, for the week ahead. Thanks very much, guys. Have a good week. Hi, right, guys. Good morning. We all had a, uh, a good weekend. I guess the best place to, to start here is going to be with stocks, which uh, pushing lower uh, really since uh, last night, but of course continuing the, the move from last week and just some levels to be aware of as uh, usual we'll put the, the strategy report out uh, this morning get that in before midday and, and the trend line from the the low that we had uh, the back end of December last year you can see that's come in and uh, we also had that second test the 3rd of June and uh, we were tweeting about this talking about it, it seems that everyone uh, had this trend line up and obviously the first test we get of that you get a uh, a decent enough bounce and, and good level of support so it'd be key to see where we, we finish the day or or week wherever it may be in, in concerns to uh, this trend line here definitely one to, to have up really uh, looking uh, pretty strong levels below that if that was to go uh, well I'd expect to see pretty sharp move lower you've got some of some support just below there from going back to 18th and 13th of June at 84 28 84 and, and 66 but from a level I like the, the look of uh, here around 28.54, give or take a couple of points either way. Around about there uh, seems like it could be uh, a, a good enough target if that trend line was to go. Uh, to the upside, if we just uh, put this more intraday in, in terms of uh, looking at points of interest above where we're trading, Friday's low. You can see we found support there before breaking through, came back, resistance along with the S1. That's somewhere, something that I would, would keep an eye on today. Dropping it down to 15 minutes, you can see we haven't really had that proper retest of that level. Uh, good enough area of support this morning before pushing through. So there, S1, something I would be keeping an eye on. And of course, even intraday, this trend line, uh, which will come in around 2900. Uh, as well today, uh, something I would have marked up. With this, obviously, as I mentioned, gold is, is pushing higher and just putting this onto the weekly chart, you can see just how high it has come and, and levels not seen for, for quite some time. If we just draw a horizontal line, literally where we're trading now, uh, around 1450, 
uh, just a bit above. Last time we were traded, this price was 2013 uh, May time. Uh, will we get 1500? It'll be interesting to see what you guys think about that. Got quite a key level, certainly on the futures, where we just couldn't get above back in uh, 2013, 1488. Uh, around there so that is like a, a good enough resistance really breaking out of this uh, multi-year resistance point from 2016 17 and 18 uh, around 1361 so it does look like the only way is up um, 1457 obviously holding uh, relatively well on the first few tests of that but we're just trying to spread our our wings here in uh, in gold and we are above that yearly high looking more intraday I think you do have to, to favor the upside so while there could be opportunities to get short or, or whatever, looking at, at interesting you know, points of, of support. Uh, yesterday's, or I should say Friday's uh, high and Thursday's high, you can see the breakthrough of that. Uh, this sort of trend line here would be something I'd be keeping an eye on. We're trending higher, so I'd just be, you know, I did mention obviously looking for it to go long, but breaks of these kind of trends here would make you maybe not want to say, Okay, R1 was my, my original plan, but depending how it would break, this trend line may make you think otherwise. Uh, and also trend lines coming up from those lows, coming to around that same point. So around about 14.58, which of course was that longer term level anyway, I do quite like the look of uh, as an area of support uh, to, to get long again in this market, which is of course just been drifting higher. Uh, at some pace, well, to be fair, not even drifting higher, going higher at some pace over recent days. Oil, another market which has uh, seen a decent uh, enough move in recent time. However, we are starting just to, to get squeezed in uh, from both directions uh, here. Just going to make this chart a bit uh, tighter. Removing the pivot so you can see coming from those lows again, that, that low is the same one as the, uh, the US equities from December last year. See, we're just finding support on that uh, last week, and also from the upside as well, getting relatively uh, squeezed in, uh, depending where you place that trend line. So for oil, uh, certainly from a more medium-term opportunity, waiting for the break either way, I think would would be key. You can see last week we had a, a you know, decent couple of decent opportunities on break of trend lines, and if we were to to come back to this one that had broken at all this week, I'd be looking for a, you know another strong reaction. Uh, around there so that would come in around 5650 uh, which is also some low points that we had from last week looking more intraday uh, and just put this on a 15 minute you can see we are just drifting uh, to the downside uh, from those highs so again we'll be looking to to get these trend lines on i know the the volume not necessarily going to be there this morning uh, but perhaps later on as we get squeezed in from from both ways bit of a, a, a zone to be aware of below where we're trading here would get this as a bit of a rectangle you can see from Friday morning to afternoon and that coming in around 5470 uh, to around 60 on the futures that's a, a pretty key level support if that was to, to go it wouldn't be too long I would imagine just before you see the S1 and, and this longer term uh, trend line as well for the pound so, well, typed in the wrong code there. Uh, for the pound, I'd still be waiting to see can we get a break below uh, this key level. Let's just make this a bit clearer. So you can see we are uh, testing the level from uh, 2017, beginning of March. If we were to really get a break below that, we couldn't last week. If we were to get uh, a break below there, 120 is obviously the main target that people will be looking at. I've said it a couple of times, if we were to get any retracement, it doesn't look like we're going to. Uh, the trend line break that we had uh, coming in around 124 uh, would be a, a, an obvious place to, to take profit for anyone that did get long or anyone that wants to get short again uh, around there. So that's somewhere I'd be looking at. But a break below uh, these lows that we had last week, 120 would be the obvious uh, target. The Euro had a, a decent recovery uh, to the back end of, of last week post the... The Fed, we haven't uh, completely reversed the, the move from 7 o'clock that we had on Wednesday, but it's not too far away, and that would come in uh, around the R2. Uh, we are just also, we also do have some interesting levels you can see here, just above where we're trading on the high of the day, that would be keeping an eye on the low uh, of the 25th, which is the ECB. We broke through that trend on uh, the FOMC, and that would be coming in futures anyway, around 111.72 ish. 
So that'd be somewhere I, I'd, I'd have marked up on the on the chart. For those that do want to see a continuation of this longer term trend to the downside, where could that come in? Uh, well, you got all those highs from yesterday, uh, yesterday for Friday, which are really holding strong. We can't just get that that confirmation below there. So if we were to get a, a serious close below, then maybe we could get that uh, continuation. But at the moment, it does seem resilient to to any push to the downside. I'd also have this trend line on. While not necessarily respected too well this morning, you can see it's still intact in the third test just coming in there so if we were to get you know a proper break of that then then sure with those highs from Friday then I would start to be looking to go short but for now price is getting squeezed in and I'd be more comfortable waiting for higher up around the 1170 or a break of that trend quick look over the decks again just finding resistance back on s1 if that was to, to gather pace worth getting a, a trend on from uh, the previous low that we had this morning uh, the previous area of what was resistance just acting as support now uh, for, for the DAX. Half hour into the open. As usual, any questions, please do let us know. We'll get the, the strategy report out uh, before midday. Uh, so if no questions then or later, uh, please do uh, let us know. But I hope you'll have a, a great trading day uh, and a good week ahead.